I think I'm going to come in the tackle shack, light the fire, because we're sort of finished out here. Oh yeah, I'll show you this. Here I've had collections of, this is all wood from our place, our property here, but some of these I'm going to strip off. They were hazel, so they're bent for making sort of lattice work stuff. But I've got a good collection there for Mike. He's going to come and he's going to do a build. This is Hazel. I don't know her personally, but that's what they tell me she is. And they use that for weaving as well, you know. Like you see it on fences sometimes, so I'm pretty well stopped up there. <laughs> this was my, or one of the ponds I had, which ended up leaking. I couldn't be able to reline it because it was a shallow one. That is full of leaves. We take that out, that's just to crush the leaves down. This is all leaves that we had off our trees. So that's all going to rot down nicely, hopefully. So what I intend doing is, uh, in the tackle shack, light up the old G stove, get it warmed up in there, I've got a bit of sunshine as well. It's not great for filming in the bit of sunshine. I had to put a curtain up one side, it goes very white. You know, if I use uh, the old GoPro, it's not the greatest at uh, colour contrasting on those different lights. And I'm going to make, wait for this boys, Frank 2, the Frankenrod 2, and I'm going to go right through and show you. Fingers crossed I get out eventually if the wind goes down and the COVID stops, get out there and catch some more fish on it. Frank 1 has been a success. Also, I'm wiping my feet because I'm the one that's washed the mat, cleaned all out from here because one of the projects I had in here was slate cutting and uh, I made a right mess. For those who don't know, this is the tackle shack, which is Mike's old surf shack that I've reinstated. And we've got our own stove here for cooking, making tea, stuff like that. Let's get some water in that as well. Uh, I've restocked with wood because I've got through quite a bit of wood there. Clean, tidy, washed out, full of lovely fishy stuff. I have, yes, I have power here. Might want to paint out on the roof, I'm not really too worried. Look at this, good old days, the good old days, out in the boat, kitchen permit, out of Isla Mirada. Look at this one, catching bass in a self-drive boat. That's our boat there, by the way, that was in Ireland. I only had the boat about five days and I took it to Ireland, can you believe that, it must have been crazy. Look, might be the last, who knows the best eating fish, I'm telling you. Place in the UK and Dorado, in foreign tropical countries. He's all, he's all cool there, isn't he? Look, he's got those necktie things they wear as well. God, we haven't been there for years. For those who haven't seen it, here's a skull I found out in the woods. Quite a big skull, actually. Probably a relative of T-Rex, I don't know. Big tarp of Mike caught there, 140 pounds. We caught it at night in a rainstorm, that's why he's soaked in this water all over the lens. Now you can't take him out of the water, but back then we did. There's Mike with a big common skate in our own boat. Again, we towed to Ireland, caught that, it's a real, real good fish there. A tuna spreader bar. Another jump, and did that, I might have done that as well as a kid. Made uh, a shark montage, frame picture out of real shark's teeth. Anyway, I digress. It's that time of year. We'll get this lit and there may be, uh, fingers crossed, I can build that rod in here. One of the other jobs I've been doing is, is getting my landing net and netting as many oak leaves out of my ornamental pond as I can. Because I feel they break down. One of you people in the aquarium will can tell me, I think they make tannic acid, I'm not sure. So they definitely make some form of acid. So I've got them off the bottom, as many as I can. And we're going to be, you know, put them in the net. They go over here in a wheelbarrow and they're wet leaves so they all help to rot down. But what do you think, you pond enthusiasts out there, should I leave the oak leaves in there to make detritus on the bottom, which would help the lilies? That's fine. But sometimes it doesn't and they go very, very small. And I feel it's that changing the pH value of the water. I don't have, I used to have a pH testing kit when I had aquariums and stuff. So to find out whether the water is acid or alkaline, but I feel with the oak leaves going in there, it goes a slightly peaty colour. I feel that's acid. You guys, doubtless, can let me know.
Okay, here's everything you need to make a good fishing rod from a broken fishing rod. The reel is just a multiplier because I'm going to be using it for sea fishing and I will probably be using a multiplier. My spare readers. A couple of small flat files. Some masking tape. Some whipping thread. Some spare rings, old school. Plenty of a hacksaw fine scissors to go with the thread, some sandpaper, cuddly toy, <laughs> who remembers that? Good game. Stanley knife, sharpened, a fish, which I shall remove, give me more space, and a mug I shall remove. Look at this guys, look. What's happening to us in this day and age? We can't even go down the pub and have a decent beer. Right, the fire I believe is going. I've got the kettle on there. It's already nice and warm in here and toasty. You can see that. Got to get, I'll tell you what I've got to get. Outside, I've got to get a cap over there because rain comes down and sits inside. And of course, the piece you do need is this. The rod. So you might think that's a perfectly good cart rod, Graham. No, no. The tip is broken on one rod and the butt is broken on another rod. And I have been left over the years different bits and pieces from rods. And if anybody throws the thing away, I go, I'll take it. You want to buy these rings? <laughs> They're not cheap. It's worth taking a piece of broken wood and cutting the rings off and keep them for spares for yourself. But when you look, I can't do it in here. It's not big enough. The ferrule doesn't fit. This rod is a totally different rod. So what I'm going to do is going to try and use this top section here, right? I'm going to use a top section to make myself an ultralight sea fishing rod. And this one, I'm going to cut down. Look, it's got a great big long butt piece. You can see a huge carpy type butt. I don't want that. I really don't want that. I'm going to try and cut. I'm trying to think, you know, how you would normally put it about there with a butt pad. I only want about 12 inches below the winch fitting. The winch fitting is fine. Now you'll probably never be able to save those because they're glued on, to be honest. You think, oh, I could do with a nice, what's this one? Probably a Fuji one or something like that. Um, the other thing I'll show you, the rings are too big because, hopefully, those of you think it's a fishing programme, it sort of is, but it's not. But it might give other people a bit of interest. When you've got a fixed spool rod, if I can do this. Give me five minutes just to thread the line through the rings. I can show you something. I'm also actually, so you guys, the astute amongst you who say he's changed his jacket, he's changed his woolly hat. Two right I have. I've got a lug burner going. <laughs> it's going to be 75, 80 in here in about half an hour. Right. Here's a, imagine this is a car mug. It's obviously way back here as well, and it's one piece. So it bends from that winch fishing all the way up in a big arc like that, doesn't it? But I only want to use the top half because there is no bottom half to it. I'm using the top half of this one. So I'm going to be pulling really hard on a sea fish, okay? Now, if you can, you might not see it. I don't know whether you'll see it. I hold it dead still. If you look, watch this break, watch this break. If you look, there's the curve of the rod, but the line goes between the rings. Do you get me? Well, you'd never normally have a curve this acute on the top half section really, only when you're playing the fish. But of course, with boat fishing, sea fishing, we're turning the rod right the way up the other way, okay? So then the problem is, as I pull like this, you might, might be able to see it, the line goes from ring to ring underneath the blank. So really sort of inefficient way of fishing because that's gonna be, if I find the fish wrong, it's gonna be rubbing alongside of the blank. So I need, look, you can see here, it's down below the rod blank. You can see I'm going to need another ring there. Look, okay. And the same happens if I come in here. You might go, I hope you see it. Just we used to build rods years ago, all the time. All my pals did. They all built rods. Right now, look here. Ring, ring, line is not in a nice neat curve. It follows a straight line. It goes underneath the blank like that. So I will need another ring to this side on the top to keep it away from the blank because I'm putting a totally different bend in the rod. The other thing is, what you, what you should do really, most blanks will come with what they call a spine. When they make the blank on what sort of mandrel, the blank, 
it will be stiffer on one side than the other. Now we used to find the uh, spine by, it, don't forget it was just a blank, it had no rings on it whatsoever. It was, you put it down like this, right? you put the top section down like this, and you put a bend in it, keep your hand on there, I can't really do it because there's a ring on it, and roll it. In fact, I can still feel a bit of a, a bit of a spine there now, okay? So now, how can I describe it? This is a casting cart rod, so the spine is correct in as much as the stiff part of the spine is this way, but when you cast like that, you want the extra power of the spine to cast. How I can best describe it, the spine makes one way will be soft, one way will be much stiffer, but I want it the other way around. So I'm probably gonna take that ring off, heat it inside, I don't think I'll heat it on the G stove, it'll probably melt. Heat it, twist it around 180 degrees, reset it, because I'm going to be fishing with it upside down, aren't I? And I want that extra, like this, I want that extra lifting power like this, guys. That's what I want. Look, it's a fun rod, it's a fun rod. I've already used Frank one, the old Frank and Rob one, and caught fish on it. I want to catch fish on it again. It's great fun. So, first thing I'm going to do, cut these rings off and twist the tip ring round and re -glue it. Okay boys, fast forward a bit. I have a nice set of spare intermediate cart rod rings. Should I need them up and clean them up? I have sanded down the blank. I've gone indoors, I've melted off and I've re-glued the, the rod tip ring there on the opposite side of the spine that it was. So it's set now. So when I roll it like this, it, it just you can you can you can feel that extra power. The power now comes down the way I want it. It's not for casting, it's totally the reverse of the spine, it's for pulling. So now I'm going to whip these small rings I've got here. Or that, that tip ring's fine, but I've left it as a cart ring there because basically, not because it's got some silicon carbide insert or something to it, but because it's wide and will therefore take a leader knot if I want to use a leader or rubbing leader or rubbing trace when I'm sea fishing. Right, let's count out how many rings we want. You don't have to take my word for it, guys. The oven part of this stove is on the way to 150. It's warm. Now that I'm only looking for a selection of small intermediate rings, and the previous rod I built, Frank one, I built with these ones because I've got loads of them. So as you can see, I don't throw anything away. Never have done, and never will do. And these are all, by the look of it, you see they're pretty much the same size. There's a slightly bigger one, in case I want to graduate it. So I'm going to search through here. There's another bigger one. Come out, you naughty boy. You. I've used that one before. Oh, we'll have him again. He's got a new lease of life. I'm only using the slightly larger ones in case I have leading leader knots. That should probably do me. Now another tip you need to do. So if you look at this one, the one I've taken off, you might be able to see if I bring it forward, the camera might or might not focus. It's, it's had just the foot, the foot of the ring here filed off, so it's a slope, it goes down like this. That's how your whipping thread can come up it, rather than come along the blank and go up like this and keep slipping down all the time. It really doesn't matter because, you know, for me, this is personally doesn't matter. Some people are real pernickety and want it immaculate. I'm not too bothered, it will still hold the ring on. But the proper way to do it is to get the file and file that foot down so there's a nice, smooth, graduated slope for the whipping thread to come up. So I'm gonna to have to do that with these guys. And for that, I'm using 
luckily we've got most bits and bobs of tools to hand a couple of these flat files I just sit here for 10 minutes and file away on the bottom end of the foot just to put a little slope on it because that is a very crude ring this one there and it's sort of rounded it's just the way it's moulded I guess so I'm going to try and do this so next job is file the feet of the rings to a decent slope well guys the fire's going really well as you can see so I'm going to take a break from filing all those down and have a really nice seafood cocktail don't have to cook it crabs looks like mussels, cockles, prawns, shrimps, who knows, it's all in there a little bit of balsamic vinegar on that and uh, that'll do nicely I shall get back to you shortly right lunch is over I file all these rings down I'm going to make a start on getting that top section whipped up a lot of this sort of guesswork really you can put a bend into the rod and get a felt pen or a white marker and just mark every so often you know where the line wouldn't touch the blank but I know roughly after having done it for a few a good many years of salvaging rods and making rods out of absolutely nothing roughly you know where to put them and you don't use much thread in fairness when you're using small rings like this I have plenty of thread. Spin the thread in what they call touching turns as best you can. Look, this is how I build my rods. You know, we don't want the superhero rod builder saying, Don't you do like that? Well, <laughs> I do do it like that. Yeah, that's so how I do do it. And catch plenty of fish with it as well. And most important, people, I enjoy myself. I feel as though I've done something. I've achieved something. I've got something that I wouldn't have otherwise have had. And do you know what it's cost me pretty well? Nothing except time. Doing this in my uh, tackle shack, which I've renovated totally myself, with a lovely stove going, middle of winter, it's warm. Well, you tell that, I've had to take more and more clothes off. I'll be going commando soon, I should think. That thing gets any more heat. Well, boys, the light has changed. As you can see, it's much better in here now. Sun's gone down. Really going to freeze tonight. Fire's gone out. So, I've been out looking around for different fitters because I thought I might have had another fatter, if you like, broken section. But I'm going to cut up the butt now. But what you've got to work out is where you want the winch fitting, where you want the butt. So I'm probably going to cut the butt off first, slide some cork up, I doubt I'm going to get that is off the bottom here. On Frank 1, the old Frank and Rod 1, I use a piece of drawer handle or doorknob, just a wooden one. That's a nice one, it's soft, but I might have to uh, see if I can get off in hot water or something like that. I've got a ring up there, I can save that as a spare. But what you've got to, you, you've got to work out here, there's the cart rod, I'll put this this way. That's quite a thin diameter, so as I come down here, if I go down to where I want the fitting, you can see about there, there's a big difference in diameter there. So fingers crossed, I can cut away this whipping bit here, and I can get slid in by about, uh, I'd like to get about five, about five inches inside that winch fitting. Right, see so if I can get the fire back up again, because it's going to be cold now. And uh, we work off. As you can see, all the rings there. Hopefully you can see that. All the wing, all the wings, all the wings are really whipped on there. <laughs> all the rings are really whipped on there. All I've got to do is varnish them. Uh, the equivalent of a butt ring I kept quite small. Just an old Fuji one I had there. Right. You can get this fire again. <laughs> All the carp anglers now quaking in their bivvies at the, at the thought of sawing a perfectly good carp like that. Well, it's not perfectly good. It's called a panther, whatever that is. I'm not going to get that off, I don't think. Uh, 
So, what we're looking for, guys, is this piece going into that piece. No, that's not happening. So I've got to shave this down a little bit more, or I can come back down here. Depends how thick the wall is there. Saw on the end off there, there's my winch fitting. There's the butt section, I hope to get that bum off there. I've taken off some extension, well, sort of extension whippings here for when you cast on a spigot ferrule. So if I put that out the window, out the door there, by shaving that first piece off, it now pretty well, if you see that, look at that, oh my god, that is as near perfect as I'm ever going to get, and that makes something like a six foot to seven foot rod. But I want to put cork on there first, I want to put cork up here first, and that should, if I've got some, slide straight on, I might have to tape it and pack it, and then hopefully, yeah, the winch fitting is all still, still functioning, we could be on a winner. So what I've done is put some masking tape there, a sort of packing tape to make up the space because don't forget the farther this goes down into the blank, generally most butts are tapered so it gets bigger, the hole gets bigger, but this is just enough that just to pity, you've got to leave space so I can slide it, I can slide it down loose like this, can it? but I pull it back up and it just pinches there, so that's idle by the time I get a bit of glue in there. So all I need now now, a piece of cork which I found from my sack of spare corks I've got here. I cut straight edge on that there, and the same on this end. I don't want to pick it through. I need a bigger tackle shack, boy. Same on there. It's going to go just about right there, and hopefully get all this set up for you tonight. And then just basically I can finish it. I'll show you. I'm not going to glue this first. I'm going to do the bottom half first, and just get these. These sections are cool, cut to the right dimensions. It's so toasty in here. 10 minutes of this stove. A, you'll probably run out of wood. B, it's just so hot, let's hang up a, a coat up there a second I'll get myself organized. I'll tell you what I like about it, boys. When you make yourself a Frankenrod like this, you know there is only one like it. It is perfect. There you are. What I'm going to do is put a bit of taper on this first, just like I did on Frank one. You can do it with the sandpaper, you can do it just with a standing knife or box cutters, chip away there, and I can, I can pack that out with whatever I want. I'll probably end up using uh, bathroom fluid, you know, silicon sealant or something like that on it. So do the front section. This is ideal there. I think you're going to see this, people. That slides in there. I've got to come to about there. And this, when these are glued together, these are in, in sections. So you can do it, look, either with a standing knife or you'll get a much neater one and a straighter one using a junior hacksaw. Like this. There we go. This one got to the wrong way there. Now I'm going to taper up here. I can even taper both ends if I want. I'll probably slightly taper those off a bit more, which you can do with a coarse sandpaper, that's what I'm using, and then change the grades as it uh, sort of breaks up. Just be careful with it if you've got the, the cork. Look, I've had mine years, this is 30, 40 years old, this cork. That one's perfect, actually. Look, that's what it was. A carp, 12 foot test curve, two and a quarter pounds. Well, it was. This one's nice and tight, so actually I'm gonna I'm gonna scrape that off there because that would be too tight. Let's get the measurement done first. Well, beggars can't be choosers, can they? It's a made-up rod, but this is absolutely. <laughs> The inside diameter and the outside diameter have absolutely got to be the same, and it's very tight. So what I'm going to use, if you need to make stuff slip without being oiled everywhere, is you get some silicon spray like this. Graham, yeah I know, it's a fire. And I'm hoping that might make that 
slide on there because I don't, I can split it if I have to, but I'd like to get it on without breaking it if I could. Well, after much twisting and bashing, I've got it on, but I've got a crack down there which I'm going to fill with ground up cork. I'll show you what I'm doing. The top one here, the foregrip, is probably need a little bit of masking tape just to give it a little bit of grip before I put the glue in there. All I'm, all I'm going to be doing is just this. Just a few turns. Top and bottom. You can use the middle as well if you want because that spreads the, that's where most of my power is going to come from if I do get a fish is holding on the foregrip. To be honest, the butt you don't really got any pressure on there do you? So let's see if that's made that packing's made. Yeah that's it. That's enough for that's enough for the glue to take. And then of course I can put into that my section like that. Right, let's get gluing. I'm not going to need a huge amount of glue, just enough to actually nick on the cork as it were, you know. And I'll put a little bit round there because when I slide it down, it's going to be uh, pushing that other glue further down. Such fun this is, making rods from absolutely nothing, well from broken pieces. There we go, so I'm just spinning this to rotate that glue, I just wet my finger, just go around there like that, and then I can put some, when I finish this glue up, I'll put that serpentine glue around the uh, top there. Just put a bit around the edge there. Just helps seal it up more than anything. The same around the base, but wait till you see what I'm going to be using for the butt cap. It's exclusive to Totally Awesome Fishing People. Do you know what it is? Anybody recognise it? That's right. It's a knob. Smith, Smith, stop that. It's a knob of a gas cooker. No one's going to have one of those, are they? And it's slanted, so I'm going to put the slant upside down where it's opposite to where the reel would go. It looks like a pretty perfect diameter. A little bit of packing around there should be good. Now then the reel is going to be this way, I'm going to be fighting it that way, so the slight angle I've got on the gas knob there, I'm going to put around this way, so that's it won't dig into me, that's the idea of it. I'm not going to bother with uh, filling that with cork, I don't think. I'll just pile some glue in there. Just so it's cutting it. Like that. I can push some bits of cork in there, run a bit around the edge like this. All good fun. Here we go. And then we rest that there. Let's get the top section here. Fire's going out now. It is indeed getting much colder. I've used that all before, but you know, I, I wonder if this stuff's going to do the same job. Technicians out there, let us know what you think Gorilla Glue is like. I've had no trouble with it before, I must admit. Main thing guys, remember, line up your winch fittings with the rod rings, <laughs> otherwise it's going to be back to front. Just taper that off, that glue. I'm just going to put the reel on. And the reason for that being, that's probably the reel I'm going to use for it, I turn it around. Because with the reel like that, I can then point it down the rod like this, look down there like this, and line up before it all sets the rod rings, the rod butt, and just rest it gently down here to set for the night. 
Well, boys, I'm back here in the tackle shack. It's horrible and cold out there. Now, I know guys over, they live in Alaska, Nova Scotia, Canada, the Rockies. I realise that they go, that's not cold. We have 10 feet of snow. Or if we say we've got two degrees below freezing, they go, we've got 50 degrees below freezing. Now, we all live in different areas. Topographically and geographically speaking, it depends where you are. We get what's called a maritime climate, and trust me, it's a cold moisture in the air. It goes right through your bones. All you British guys, back me up. Otherwise, you look a load of wimps. If we get four inches of snow, <laughs> the country comes and seizes to a halt. So what I've been doing, guys, look, the rod has dried. Okay, that's all dried. I've got to clean off. I told you the excess of the glue there. I'm going to trim that off with a standing knife. The old gas cooker cap, that's on, it's all set. So it's fine. And I was going to varnish and I thought, no, I really like being awkward. I like to be so different. I'm going to paint it. Blue. <laughs> all the tail tops. Oh, oh my God. I'm going to paint it with blue gloss. It's a sort of, I don't know, shabby chic of fishing rods. But I've had to light the fire. But the problem I've had with this stove, I've not had a problem with it, rain comes through the little funnel at the end. Mike said there is a cap that comes with it sometimes, or you can buy it as an extra. We don't have them. And I've noticed on both the pallet cabin, for those of you who look at that, follow our TA outdoors, the pallet cabin was built out of pallet wood. Sad that I can't tell you, a gazillion views, 22 million views or something. This one has a large stove in it, the other one has a small stove. They're both the same pipe as far as I know. So I've made, out of a couple of bits of sections of drain pipe, taped them together, just a cap. And I've also made it so that I can reach up and take the cap off and then light it. Don't light it with the cap up there. Very smoky inside. Well, it won't, generally won't light. Um, so I've got the heat going, it's up now. It's, it's a little bit warmer in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rub this rod down and then I'm going to uh, give it a coat of gloss. Wow. I might just get some water and have a cup of tea or something. It's bitter out, it's bitter. It's one degree which is just above freezing, but with the moisture in the air and a northern airflow off the Arctic, it ain't pretty. Mama Mia, it's starting to crank up in here now. One degree outside, about 75 to 80. <laughs> Blood's flying again. Right, I'm going to sun three guys, and then I'm going to start the paint on the right. Here we go. Hopefully, I can get them out. Should be able to see those bubbling a bit. Right, problem number one. Get plate ready, Graham. Look at this, boys. Look at this. Melted cheese sandwiches. So careful getting hold of that, Graham. Let's get it out first. These little stoves are brilliant. All that remains to be added to that other than bits of ash. Isn't that colourful? Now I've got so much ketchup on there I won't be able to taste the cheese. Let me just do this, we flip one piece onto the other piece, take it apart, steaming sandwich. The wife wonders why I come out here so much working in this tackle shack. I can do it at home, of course I can do. But what a bit of fun. There we go. So just to keep the serious rod builders happy, we used to use with this silk, the whipping silk, uh, a dope, a dope first, which would sort of shrink and seal up the whippings and then varnish on top and that sort of preserved the colour of the whippings as well if you had colour whippings. 
In my case, I'm using gloss paint for a door. Now, one tip for anybody who does want to do it, let's say, well, with varnish, you'd be tempted to hold it here by the foregrip, start working away, start working away, filling up, filling up, filling up, filling up, uh-oh, 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 uh, on the wet paint. So I find, having done dozens of these, but with varnish or with paint with anything, you start at the tip first, you can work your way back and finish holding the butt, so you can work your way down towards your, your hand. Should have brought my reading glasses on so this would go anywhere. Probably not with a blue desk. And it, it, it will seal up just as well, to be honest, as, as, as varnish. Somebody say varnish is better. I don't care, I'm using blue paint. It's a Franken rod. The Frankenstein of rods, it's, it's made up out of bits and pieces of everything. And then, when this is dry, I'll probably have to speak very nicely to Wayne, because I can't see me getting my boat out with this virus knocking around. <clears throat> Half the places are shut, they don't even want my money for launching. That's fine, that's okay. I might be able to jump on Wayne's boat and at least get out and try and catch a fish on the Frank and Rod 2. Frank 2! Frank 2 I'm calling it. This blue actually hardly looks like blue. It looks shocking really in the uh, in the can. You think you can't be painting a rod like that. I'm, I'm liking it boys. If it runs and get the odd blob, blob on it, whatever. It's broken rod made good. I've made rods like this for Bonefish, I've had small tarpon, I've had pike, carp. If you can get a bonefish on one of these, trust me, you know it works. Permit, I've had permit. When I used to go to Florida Keys, the good old days of big game fishing. Sport fishing, they call it. And I'm finishing with just one stroke so that it looks reasonable, you know. Don't put too much on at one go because you're dealing with a, a fine diameter piece of. Uh, carbon or fiberglass, it's real easy to overcook it and then you get a big drip that goes probably on the table if you're lucky which will get you in trouble with the wife or worse it goes on your trousers which in my case will get me in serious trouble with the wife. I think I've only got two pairs of trousers to my name. <laughs> Clean ones and dirty ones. The ones in the wash. And what they tell me, one of our awesome army guys and I will be getting a pair Something called softies, which are military, ex-military, military grade, military surplus, over trousers or something they are, and they're thermal. He said, Graham, you'll never be cold in them again. So I shall be trying to track some down and get hold of a pair of softies. Not too worried about jackets, I'm okay for jackets, I've got a Heli Hansen. I've never ever been cold in that Heli Hansen. Second hand, I think it was eight, I think it was eight pound in the charity shop. So there we go guys, it's all blued up, <laughs> it's all blued up, it's all done, all I'm going to do is be able to get it out of the tackle cabin, so I'm going to leave it in here, it's so dry, it, uh, it's warm, it'll go off quickly here, and uh, fingers crossed, and hopefully the next time I see you people, we'll be with Frank 2 in full battle curve, with a big fish on the end, well, that's a theory anyway. Hope you enjoyed it. See you guys next time. Don't forget, broken fishing rods, do not throw them away. You might be able to make something out of them. And we've been clearing up twigs. Can you believe it? How interesting is that? Twig, the massive world record twig picking up with those things that pick up like litter. A massive heap there. So I'm going to have a bonfire. You can see a massive heap. But just out of interest, guys, I found a really weird, well, it's a fungi, fungus, I don't know what it is. It's like jelly, and I want you guys out there, because I know one of you out there is going to know what this one is. Bright orange, I'll show you what it is. There's always somebody in the Totally Awesome Army that can help us out here. It's not very big, as you can see there. Let me just show it and turn it over. It's almost like a sort of flower. Can you see that against that, the contrast of the green there? But it's, look, it's really yucky. As I say, it is an oak tree it's growing on. 
it's like it's like a sort of an, an enemy and then and then and then well, it is sort of just after Christmas there's a lot of mulled wine to clear up it's like an anemone anybody out there look if I just wobble like this you can see how jellified it is anybody out there know what that one is there's another piece here this one's got totally mushed I think that one there so I can mush out a bit more like kids do look yucky yucky that is disgusting well what is that and it retains so much moisture, that's what I'm interested in. So, school time question for everybody that's on lockdown and nothing else to do. Who knows what this fungus is? Also, will Graham survive having touched it with his finger? Very pretty, I think you'll agree. Also, uh, put out leftover bits of roast beef for Colin the kite and I hope he comes over on the raptor table there. I'm employing the services over here. This, this lady seems to be quite good at picking up the sticks. So we'll see later on if we do get Colin on the camera. I have seen him, he's been up there. Up there whirling around on the wind. I fear there's gonna be no fishing for some time. It's still very, very windy. People, thanks for watching the Tony Awesome Fishing Show. Hit the subscribe button, TA Fishing, TA Outdoors. Hit the notification bells and we will see you in the next episode. I hope that's stuck the right way round. <laughs>